Hello everyone, I am Fabian Ostermann. I welcome you to my presentation of our paper Artificial Music Producer Filtering Music Compositions by Artificial Taste. In this talk I will give you insights to our idea of filtering music compositions by rejecting bad outcomes in order to improve final results of artificial music composers. As an example use case we model artificial taste as a classification task in order to apply machine learning with neural networks. I will show an experimental study on this. It results in an intelligent musical agent that we identify to do the same job as a human music producer but much faster. During a discussion about music recommender systems, we have found that musical taste has an interesting nature. We thought it is curious how intuitive we use it in our everyday life. Then we thought, how is it about composers who naturally have the same ability? So, what does taste mean for them? And we thought, yes, they are using it too. They can, for instance, use it to make creative decisions, since humans that are doing creative tasks are often in the process of self-evaluation with revisiting, analyzing and redoing previously written parts of an unfinished composition. Masterpieces are usually the result of multiple attempts. Then, of course, one could argue that if each and every attempt leads to a masterpiece, or at least turns out good, then we say there's a master at work. Maybe this separates the so-called musical genius from mediocre or amateur composers. With this in mind, we then thought, how is this with artificial music composers? Today there's less self-evaluation as there was in the past. For instance, when we think of the popularity of evolutionary approaches that use fitness functions. The current goals of full automatic approaches are more like, can we get our system to produce something that sounds good? We argue that this way a sense for taste is unintentionally implied. If an algorithm would succeed in such a target setting, the invented music system would instantly gain ingenious qualities. Here we find this implicit goal is clearly overambitious and worse, it can limit or even hinder creativity of composers, regardless if they are human or AI. So, we have to make a step back first. We need an automated measure modeling individual taste that an artificial composer can use when composing. I have brought to you a quote from the great jazz composer Duke Ellington. There are two kinds of music, good music and the other kind. What makes a good laugh at first, I think, actually speaks volumes about how artists reflect their creative processes. Alenkin misguides the listener that he is going to say something theoretical, but he wants to say that classification to genre or musical epochs set limitations for creative thinkers. If we try to follow that simple idea and quickly make up a formal definition, we could go as follows. Given a preprocessed feature vector m that is representing a musical object, then the function of musical taste T of an individual i is Ti of m is equal to y, where y is one of the classes good or bad, or worded in terms of taste, like or dislike. Of course, you could argue that taste is not stable and can vary, for instance, with one's current mood, but we did just stop here because we wanted to see this approach as a kind of practical thought experiment which we wanted to push as far as we could in terms of both conceptual implications and practical application. In our opinion, this oversimplification rather provides some major advantages. For example, learning T of M and using it to filter out poor results improves existing artificial composers without the need of modifying or rewriting the code Another proposal, teams of creative co-workers can share workload. For instance, one uses her or his creative efforts to develop algorithms that generate new original ideas and another developer deploys a machine learning algorithm that identifies desired characteristics within the results, what makes the results more controllable. Additionally, here we think Filling the taste function with life is also a highly creative task. For instance, when determining it using machine learning techniques that target supervised learning, we need to curate some training corpus in order to be able to control the behavior of an artificial composer so that it does what we want. In order to develop application scenarios, we wanted to analyze the relationship of composers and taste. At first, the human composer is 
self-dependent by writing a piece and publishing it. In discussions, we came up with the idea that the taste in decision processes in the professional music industry is represented by a music producer. That is stage two, in which the composer provides a variety of pieces to the music producer, who, as an experienced listener and critic, chooses the best creations. Stage three is maybe the state of the art in music production. There are generators that can represent any kind of computer aid, like music notation software or digital audio workstations, that simply increase the speed of a production. Composers can compose more pieces in less time, which results in additional workload for the producer. Then, when we think of AI, the generator may become an even more sophisticated composing algorithm. Then at some point we reach the practical problem that no human can listen to music faster than it can be played. Here we propose to insert a discriminator, our new stage 4, that automatically evaluates results by predicting producer decisions. Therefore it needs an implementation of the taste function to be able to classify compositions in one of the classes like or dislike. This looks a bit like general adversarial networks. Our approach, however, is different in that way that we can have humans involved in the development of composing strategies. This allows for preserving creativity within the musical results, for instance, when the concern is originality. Our next step should be one to handle this subjectiveness. So, we thought, are we able to start a practical experiment on artificial taste that is as objective as possible. We came up with this. There are those 389 Bach chorales and 369 of them are four part harmonizations of melodies. Because of their homogeneous structure they were often targeted for the task of style imitation. That is why we found Debug, which is an AI system that produces such chorales. So we set ourselves the goal is it possible to improve the outcomes of debug by learning to distinguish the false from the real chorales? In our formulation, that means we created a set of exactly 369 fake chorales and declare to dislike them. For the initial test of what could be possible in learning taste, we decided to pre-process the choral corpus into smell spectrograms, MFCCs, piano roll, and an event-based representation that we created with MIDI CSV. We chose neural networks to learn the taste function. We wanted to compare different types and architectures. The first four are classic fully connected multi-layer perceptrons with one, two and three layers and one mini version for baseline comparison. The second type are convolutional networks. We chose a deep architecture with and without fully connected dense layer attached at the end and again a baseline mini version. Third, we constructed different LSTM networks with one or two LSTM cells concatenated with and without attached dense layer and again a mini version with less units as baseline. So here is the statistical comparison of the initial experiment results. We can see that all representations had a certain success. MLPs were able to distinguish chorales by piano roll. Interesting is that the deep CNN architectures performed worse, probably because the training corpus was a bit short for them. The mini CNN nevertheless was able to perform the detection. The LSTMs also show certain success. The event-based format MIDI CSV, however, definitely needs more fine-tuning. The initial experiments were performed with excerpts of three seconds only. The best combinations were chosen to try bigger window sizes. Unsurprisingly, the bigger the excerpt, the better the prediction. Further, we started to not calculate accuracy only excerpt-wise but averaged the output neurons probabilities over the chorales to do chorale-wise prediction. And we can see that this always leads to a higher prediction accuracy, which proves that there must be an information of reliability in those probabilities. This we can take advantage of for better classification results. With this in mind, we defined a measure of quality, which we called Buckness B because it is to represent how much bug is in one sample. 
we can see that there is a correlation between predictions of different models for the same corral, so there must be a general information in the data. Now we are able to do things like sorting the fake corrals by the buckness quality, as you see on the right. Also, with the new measure, we are able to visualize and interpret our predictions. Furthermore, we now have a reason to listen to some examples. What you see here is the buckness predicted by several models plotted as graph over the temporal dimension of one corral. The piece we heard is the worst qualified one from fake 369. Now we will listen to the best one. The biggest difference you can notice is that the bad one has massive tone repetitions as already can be seen by looking at the figure. The other one, however, shows a fair amount of harmonic movement similar to what Buck would have done. In the left figure we can see that the Buckner's prediction is not stable. It is possible to identify good and bad excerpts with this approach to analysis. Interestingly, the different models agree on this big swing at the end. Spread chords are obviously not liked and indeed those are quite untypical for Bach's style. Now let's listen to the right example. You might have already guessed, this is the worst of Bach's corals, according to our models. Interestingly, there is this moment where the bass is getting far below the other three voices. It's detected as, let's not say bad, but as atypical for Bach by the AI. Now we could take the best models and compare other quality measures. We argue that precision is the most value measure in this case, because it presents the certainty that a sample predicted to be positive is a true positive. This is important when we now try to work on newly generated corals that were not included in the training corpus. We called this attempt creating the perfect corral. More correct, however, would be to say creating the best corral possible regarding the combination of the debug generator and our filtering agent. In order to do that, we started an endless loop of generating new corals and evaluating them, which means we can immediately sort the outcomes by the buckness. When digging deeper through this list, I would say it confirms the assumption that the models are awarding harmonic movement and dissonances are usually get resolved. The worst examples show tone repetitions and we have observed parallel harmonic movements. We also provide all those artificial chorales in audio and MIDI format as supplemental material. In total we have wanted to generally perform even more musical analysis. Maybe this will be one goal for follow-up experiments. It is certainly future work we would like to do. We demonstrated a possibility to improve generated music of artificial composing algorithms by rejection sampling. This could help in the big task of controlling AI-generated music. Then we propose to use machine learning in music creation attempts not only for generation but also for the reclassification of results or even to integrate self-evaluation into generation procedures. Further, we want to share our insight that the working with the artificial producer meant a lot of fun when it comes to listening to its kind of sorted playlists. This could be used for guided browsing, because computer-generated music systems may easily provide vast amount of music, 
For future work, we could try to run our experiment on real subjective taste data that we, of course, would have to collect first. As I see myself, also as a musician and composer, I'm, of course, interested in building my own music system that is able to self-evaluate parts of its compositions. Finally, it would be possible to adopt our approach to other artistic domains, like painters, writers, architects, you name it. Okay, thanks to all listeners. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation on the Artificial Music Producer.